so um, good evening, everyone. Um, it, it's been a long weekend for me. So I've been, I've been teaching ECGs the entire weekend. And so this is part of our Northampton ECG interpretation course. And I thought it'd be useful to have some bits on supraventricular arrhythmias because obviously it is a major potential impact in terms of device therapy um, and the potential for inappropriate device therapy. So uh, I've got some stuff here that I'd like to go through, which includes specifically supraventricular arrhythmias. Uh, and then we've got some clips on how we get things like AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, AV reentrant tachycardia, and when my computer does something, there we go, thank you very much. Come on. Oh, it's been really slow, there we go. So we can look at the classification of, uh, of SVTs, including sinus tachy, we'll look at sinus node reentrant tachycardia, atrial tachys, AF, atrial flutter, AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, and then the different forms of AV uh, atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia, including orthodromic, antidromic, and also pre-excited atrial fibrillation. And th these obviously have a major potential impact in terms of device therapy. So we can also classify um, uh, supraventricular tachycardias in terms of their RP uh, relationship. So we have what's a long RP and also a short RP tachycardia. So that's dependent on looking at your QRS and then just measuring back to your P wave. Is it short or is it long? And from there, we can classify, uh, if my computer moves, which it does very slowly, into the short RP tachycardias, which include a typical AVNRT, so typical AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, orthodromic AVRT, and also an atrial tachycardia, and those that have got a long RP tachycardia, which include an atypical AVNRT with a slow, fast slow pathway, sinus tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, sinoatrial node reentrant tachycardia, and some very uh, rare forms of AVRT as well. So what we'll do is we'll just go through those and just look at those as examples, and then um, we'll look at how they're actually generated. So let's start off with sinoatrial node reentrant tachycardia. So this is a reentrant tachycardia, so therefore it starts with an abrupt onset. It may have a gradual offset, uh, and generally, because it is around the SA node, we end up with a very similar P wave morphology to those in sinus rhythm. If they may have some minor differences when we look in leads 2, 3 and AVF, but generally it ends up with a very similar morphology to that that we see in a sinus rhythm. The rates, typically the, the, the classical rate is actually 127 beats per minute. Why it's 127 beats per minute, I don't know, but the, the range is between 100 and 140 beats per minute. And if we look at this example we've got here, we can see we have our PQRS coming through, and then we have a slightly different P wave morphology when we compare it to those that were in the SA node reentrant tachycardia, but it is very similar, but just very subtly different. So how does this all come about? So fingers crossed this works. Is that working? Yes, it is. Good. Is that working? Can you see the, uh, the movie clip? Yep. Yep, good. So we end up with a reentrant tachycardia around the SA node, it then ends up going down the AV node using the Hispokinji system. So we end up with a narrow complex, which looks identical to sinus rhythm. The only difference is the fact that sometimes the P wave morphology can be slightly different. Backman's bundle is still working, going across to the left atrium. Um, but we do end up, as I say, with a P wave that is just very slightly different, subtly different, about the same as a glass of Sauvignon Blanc versus the original. Um, but it's, um, it, it's very, very similar. Generally, this shouldn't have an impact on device therapy. You're generally going to be at a rate that's below those that are impacted, but it may just impact in terms of um, looking at rates. And um, when's the commonest time that this occurs? Often it occurs after people have had an EP study, they've had an ablation, Sinus, uh, sinus atrial node reentrant tachycardia is very common after we had intervention within the atria rather than it being a native problem with the heart. Other options we have. So, sorry, go ahead. 
Quick question. Can, can you get this with um, any, for instance, doing a threshold test in the atrium? Absolutely. That still classes, classes as intervention within the atrium. So, yeah. So you can trigger this uh, by pacing, usually in the in the immediate implant period rather than chronically. So if you've got somebody who's got an RA lead in that's been in for like five years, it's very unlikely to get anything initiated by this. Whereas if you're in, you know, the, coming up to the first checkup, you know, six weeks down the line, then yeah, absolutely. That's the sort of time window we're looking at for getting that. And it's completely benign. You know, it's, it's just a, a, a minor issue. Um, it, it doesn't cause any major problems. Is that okay? Excellent. Just, uh, yeah, thank you. That's brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, my wine's not finished. Okay. So, atrial tachycardias. So, this is a narrow complex tachycardia generally rates over, well, it has to by definition have rates over 100 beats per minute. And the P wave morphology very much is determined by where in the atria we're going to get things. Diagnosis by definition is greater than three con consecutive beats. And the QRS morphology should be normal unless we're expecting there's an underlying bundle branch morphology. And we expect to have an isoelectric baseline compared to that that we see with an atrial flutter. Whereas we never, with a true atrial flutter, uh, be that um, uh, left atrial or a right atrial, we do expect that there will no, there no longer be an isoelectric line. Whereas with atrial uh, tachycardia, we expect to be an isoelectric line with a atrial uh, tachy P wave morphology that occurs intermittently. They are, tend to be quite quick. So we often get two to one, three to one heart block. Uh, and as I say, they can occur in the, both the left and the right atrium. And we can actually make a decision on whether we think it's like to be left or right atrial in origin by looking at the P wave. It's negative or neutral in AVL, then we expect that that's going to be in the left atrium. Uh, if it's going to be positive in V1, again, we expect it to be in the left atrium. And fingers crossed this will work. It's working. So here we have an example of a left atrial tachycardia. Uh, we've actually got an inverted P wave across here. So this is occurring this way. It's actually using Backman's bundle reversely to get into the right atrium before then going down the SA node. But generally, um, that doesn't cause any major conduction issues. We still end up with a P wave morphology in advance of our QRS. Every single one of these images that you see on here have been generated via PowerPoint by me spending hours doing them. But anyway. Right atrial in, in example. So in this case, we often end up with a P wave that looks very, very similar to the native um, uh, P wave that occurs in sinus rhythm because we're aiming to have something that's very close to the SA node. It ends up in Backman's bundle in a similar fashion, but the only difference we have often is a P wave that's just subtly different to the P wave morphology that we have with the sinus beat. And these are just some ECG examples. So here we have a right atrial tachycardia. Um, we have a rate of around 160, 170 beats per minute. We have a P wave that's just visible before the QRS, narrow complex, not very good ECG, but it's a real one. And here we have a left atrial with a positive P wave that's visible in, again, apologies for the quality, but they are real ones. And so this is a positive P wave that we can see here in V1. Uh, with a rate of around 140 beats per minute. In this case, again, a narrow complex. Atrial tachycardia, they can be precipitated often by having had an AF ablation. When you've got a lot of burning within the atria, that in its own right can lead to individual tachycardias that can be a bit of a nuisance. Um, they can be a problem in their own right, and they tend to occur generally in the elder population rather than the younger. So if you now look at AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, which is obviously the most common form of SVT that we've seen, this involves a reentrant circuit in or around the AV nose, and often you can end up with a retrograde P wave that's often visible or hidden just in the tail of the QRS. And this can lead to the formation of what's called a pseudo R wave in V1 or a pseudo S wave in the inferior leads. So if you look at this person here, who happens to have a sinus beat over across here, and if we look at in lead two and then in V1 across here, 
when they go into an SVT, we end up with this little beat across here, which is actually a retrograde P wave on the tail of the QRS, sim uh, simulating a, a pseudo R wave in V1, but it's not really an R wave. Uh, and in lead two, we can end up with this S wave that's occurring, which was not present beforehand. So there are some subtle changes on the 12 lead ECG during the tachycardia that can you that can give you some guidance that this is likely to be an AVNRT. Obviously, you can never be 100% sure, but it's a useful little guide and it's a good game to play when you're actually looking at people with the 12 lead ECG pre and post SVT. When we have an SVT in this case, so here we have a narrow compass tachycardia rate about 150 beats per minute. There's no obvious P wave visible, but you just get the suggestion. Is there something there just after the, uh, the R wave? Is there a little less wave in there? Um, but you know, you're not 100% sure. And obviously in this case, we've got this circulating pathway going around the AV node, going simultaneously down the, uh, the Hispokinji system and also up to the SA node to get across to Backman's bundle. And that can then lead to obviously a P wave being occurring at least late and sometimes into the tail of the QRS. So here's just another example, just showing us here we have this simulated S wave, uh, uh, sorry, R wave that's occurring at the tail of the QRS. And um, this can be a marker going, yep, yeah, this, this could be an incomplete row bundle, but actually you're looking at it and going, well, could that actually be an R, a simulated R wave relating to the P wave from uh, retrograde conduction during an AVNRT? There. Question? Yeah. So um, the, back, back, back to the previous ECG. So yeah. the, the, ST, the ST, like, slow, slight, absolute of the ST depression is that like re related like ST depression that yeah I mean we're, we're looking uh, sorry the um the the graph paper doesn't present very well but this has probably got a rate around 170 beats per minute or so okay so seeing this up sloping minor lateral ST depression is very common so, so if we so you know when we exercise pilots and they're youngsters we, we see this sort of stuff all the time and if you actually measure that at the J plus 60 to 80 milliseconds then that will be normal so there's so Although it looks grossly abnormal, actually, when you measure it formally from 60 to 80 milliseconds, it's actually normal. Normal, yeah. So it's, and what I mean is it's not it's non ischemic. It's not ischemic. No, no, not at all. Really, actually, really true. I mean, it's very similar to an exercise test. So if you look at that, it can, when you do an exercise test, you can get SD depression in this immediate post QRS phase. But that is not a marker. You do have to just ignore that and go to 60 to 80 milliseconds before you make an assessment of whether there's any ST depression. Yeah, spot on, brilliant. Good, so that's AVNRT. All right, we'll be able to get out of this window. Oh, what's happened? Oh, the world's ended. Uh, let me just reopen that. <laughs> Sorry, back there in a second. So is that uh, back there now, is it? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Let me just go on. Good. So let's go on to AV reentrant tachycardia, uh, which generally people consider to be related to Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. So Wolf Parkinson White syndrome is the presence of the accessory pathway plus palpitations. So you can get an ECG on its own, which shows pre excitation, but the patient has no palpitations. They don't formally have the diagnosis of Wolf Parkinson White syndrome because it is a syndrome including symptoms as well as the ECG abnormalities. There is a small risk of sudden cardiac death related to pre-excited atrial fibrillation, and this tends to occur under the age of 40, such that if you have someone who's now 40 plus, then really there's no benefit in looking at an EP study unless you're looking at symptoms because you're not going to alter mort mortality, whereas under the age of 40, then an EP study has the potential to reduce the mortality of that patient. Most pathways that are present can conduct both antegradely and retrogradely. It is quite uncommon to get an antegrade only or a retrograde only pathway. It does occur, but it is incredibly rare. So when we're looking at someone who's got arresting evidence of an AV uh, reentrant tachycardia, 
Well, we're looking generally that people who've got a PR interval less than 120 milliseconds going to this, the nearest deflection after the P wave. Um, generally, they'll have a QRS because of that. They'll end up with a QRS duration generally greater than 110 milliseconds with an overt delta wave, which we can see in this example across here. We have a short PR interval. In this case, it's around 80 milliseconds. We've got a delta wave. And then after the rest of the conduction of the heart is being conducted by the normal AV node, we end up with a QRS that looks relatively normal. So here we have an example of overt pre-excitation at rest. This is easily uh, visible when we look at the lateral leads. We have a very nice delta wave and we have a P wave that actually morphs straight into that QRS. Uh, across here, there is, you know, the beginning of the PR is, is probably 80 milliseconds at max before it goes straight into this. And what are we looking at? So we're looking at most of the electrical supply at the beginning of the beat goes down the AV node, which is non deck uh, sorry, but down the accessory pathway, which is non-decremental. So it just allows the electricity to go straight down the pathway without having to go through the AV node which obviously is a, a, an organism for pausing electrical supply. So most electricity goes down the AV node, depending on where it is, sorry, down the accessory pathway, pause down the AV node, but because the rest of the electrical supply is using the Hispakinji system, that tends to be quicker than those that have been using the accessory pathway. So that takes over, which is why we end up with the QRS looks roughly like that which we had started with before without the accessory pathway. So when you go into an SVT with an accessory pathway, 90% will go into what's called an orthodromic. So that involves going down the orthodox route, which means going down the AV node, but then back up the accessory pathway. And because you're now, low, now going up the accessory pathway, no longer using the accessory pathway in the undergrade fashion, you have no delta wave. So as soon as you go into the SVT, the delta wave has completely disappeared. We have a narrow complex which has got a rate of, in this case, around 170 beats per minute. There is no P wave visible because that would be into the QRS. And that occurs because we're now doing a route going up the accessory pathway, back into the right atrium, down the AV node, and then coming across the right, the, um, in this case, we're going across to the uh, left ventricle to get across and then back again. So that's why the delta wave completely disappears. But not everyone does that. So some people have an antidromic AVRT. So in this case, we end up going down the accessory pathway and everything you can see is related to a delta wave. So you end up with an ECG looking like this, which looks absolutely awful. Uh, you look at this and often in A&E, the patient will come in and they'll go, oh my God, and then they will then get electrocuted, which actually isn't a bad thing. Uh, they could have a denizine. It's not an unreasonable thing to do because they're not in atrial fibrillation. If they're in atrial fibrillation, you give a denizine and someone has got pre-excited AF, as we'll look on the next few slides, that is a disaster. But for someone who's in a antidromic AVNRT, or sorry, antidromic AVRT, then if you give a denizine, generally you will just terminate the SVT. But it looks bloody awful, and certainly A&E will not give um, uh, medical therapy for this. So we're now going all the way through this. We're using the, the Hispakinji system to get back into the septum, to get back up to the AV node, to then get back across to restart things. So everything is coming down the accessory pathway, and that leads to everything you see on a 12 lead ECG is in fact a delta wave. I'd like to point out my chicken is nearly done in the oven. So I have five minutes. In five minutes, I will just have to pop out and go and take the literally the chicken out of the oven. So this is an ECG that is the most concerning ECG for someone attending a and &E in my in my opinion. So here we have someone who has a broad complex tachycardia by definition. The QRSs are broad. We have a tachycardia rate of up to 190, 200 beats per minute. But the features on here that concern me in terms of an A and E attendance are one, it's irregularly irregular, and two, we have varying QRS durations, which suggest well, they state that this is pre-excited atrial fibrillation. 
Now, if we look at the shortest R to R interval over here, it gives a rate of less or at least 300 beats per minute. Now, if we someone along this lines is then giving some AV nodal blocking drugs so that no longer is the electrical supply allowed to go down the AV node because it's been blocked, it therefore goes down the accessory pathway and this 300 beats per minute will become persistent and that leads to ventricular fibrillation and if left death. So pre-excited atrial fibrillation such as this, do not give it any drugs whatsoever. They need to get electrocuted as soon as possible. What's it look like? And this doesn't present very well, but we'll try my hardest on this, where we end up with stuff going around the left and the right atrium and then various bits will come down the, the accessory pathway. Some will come down the AV node and the QRS duration is dependent on how much percentage wise is going down the AV node and how much is going down the accessory pathway. If everything goes down the accessory pathway, we end up with a very broad. If most things go down the AV node, then we end up with a very na narrow QRS. But the bottom line is pre excited atrial fibrillation like that, use some electricity. Atrial flutter. Um, so here we have a typical counterclockwise atrial flutter. So we go around the inert uh, parts of the atria. So the fossa is inert, the coronary sinus, obviously, because it's a tube is inert, the IVC is inert, and the tricuspid annulus is inert. So we end up with the electrical supply going through this gap between the cava tricuspid isthmus, and this is the area where we can do an ablation for atrial flutter. The majority of typical atrial flutters will be counterclockwise, um, but not all. We can end up with a typical counterclock, uh, sorry, a typical clockwise atrial flutter as well, but that's about less than 10% of cases. And here we have an example of someone who's probably in atrial flutter with a complete heart block looking at it. They've got a relatively narrow QRS, uh, but actually they're completely regular and there's no association when we're looking at the flutter waves and the, the onset of the QRS. Uh, but we can see here a typical slow down slope, rapid up slope of a typical counterclockwise atrial flutter. Atrial fibrillation sometimes it can be difficult to actually uh, manifest any obvious features that we do for atrial fibrillation, but the big thing always as ever is to look at the rhythm. So if we have a completely irregular rhythm, where it's completely irregular, no regularity at all, so regular throughout, even if you can see what you think is organized atrial arrhythmia underlying it, if it is completely irregular, then it is atrial fibrillation full stop. And this is just a slower example to demonstrate how difficult it would be to look for atrial fibrillation in terms of the isoelectric line and whether there's any evidence of uh, atrial fibrillation. Here we have an isoelectric line, which is almost completely flat. But when you look at the rhythm strip, it is completely irregular, irregular. There's nothing on here that says atrial fibrillation. This is almost flat. But the irregularity is the bit that tells you this is atrial fibrillation rather than something else. Right, I am going to have to stop at this point. If anyone wants to go to a bathroom, Blake, I've just got to go and take my chicken out of the oven, so to speak. I will be back very shortly. Oh. <laughs> my chicken, there we go, it stops, there we go. So it's interesting if you looked at that last that last clip. I, I don't know about you, Julius, but just looking at it from you know a, a quick glance, I would say, oh, you know, PACs, right? Because there's it almost looked like there's some degree of regularity in the rhythm strip. But then when you really actually look into it, if you pull out the calipers, he, he's right there. There seems to be some irregular irregularity yeah. to it. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so AFib, yeah, with an isolated ventricle ectopic. And and when you've got that um, right bundle branch block in in um, in V1, um, so that that that's typical of like I think AFib. Um, I think it's to do with the conduction. 
um, the right bundle branch and the left bundle branch. Um, um, I'm trying to I'm trying to think about the name for it. Um, um, what was it called, um, JT? What's that? Get... Sorry, I've just got back. My chicken looks really good, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you get a slow, when you get a slow, fast, um, with AF, and you get like a right bundle branch, um, just after that because the left bundle has not recovered yet, so it yeah. conducts to the right bundle. But yeah, aberrant conduction or uh, no, no, not aberrant. Um, There's a name for it. Um, There's a name for it. It just escaped me just now. Uh, uh yeah i know yeah it'll come to me in a sec <laughs> it'll come to me in a sec so that that this is a really good one for that when you get a slow conduction yeah. and and the other um, pathway um say the right bundle has not recovered enough yet so the conduction prefers to go through the left bundle so you get yeah. a right bundle branch um it's just it's just gone out of my head it will come no, to I me know, think... <laughs> this is a, a really... while since that so i yeah. <laughs> yeah right shall i continue yeah, yes, please. Yeah. Actually, having said that, I, I, I've done most of this actually already. But um, so um, so this one was just a, a marker just to demonstrate the difference between the potential for looking at the... Ashman, Ashman beats. Ashman beats. At you. Ashman, Ashman yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so on here, you, you can sit here looking, going, is that atrial flutter, is atrial fibrillation? And you're faffing around, trying to make a decision. And the bottom line is ignore what you can see as potential fibrillation slash flutter waves and go back to, is it irregularly irregular? If it's irregularly irregular, it is atrial fibrillation, full stop, end of, don't do anything else. So um, that was just a slide that gives me the option if I need to, to go through to any of the other ones that we've seen. And the rest of the, I'm just going back through, are just examples actually. Um, so, uh, excuse me. That's the same one. So these are just uh, some real life uh, 12 EDCGs. Uh, this is part of my ECG course, so hence asking them what they are. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not going to do it at this point, but here we can see actually we have this pseudo R wave just visible here in the tail of the QRS for the T wave. And in fact, that was not present at rest. And this really does tell you that this is an AVNRT that is occurring. And this little pseudo R wave here is a nice little marker. If we look at an example over here, um, this is actually related to a AVN or, uh, sorry, an AVRT. We've got nothing at all. There is nothing in there in V1 showing as a suspicion of a pseudo R wave. This is just a typical uh, counterclockwise atrial flutter. Um, and over here in V1, we can see the organized atrial arrhythmia over here. But over uh, when we look in lead two, we can see we never ever have a true isoelectric stable period. Everything is continuously moving. And it's just that this second beat of the atrial flutter goes through the QRS. That's the only period where you think, oh my God, there could be something isoelectric. There's nothing isoelectric. It is continuously moving with a slow downstroke and a slightly quicker upstroke of a typical counterclockwise atrial flutter. In this case, at a, a, a rate of 150 beats per minute with a, a two to one block. Uh, this is just another and um, this one that tends, uh, ends up being a AV nodal range from tachycardia. There is nothing suggesting a retrograde P wave that we can see across here. And we have a narrow complex and no other abnormality noted. Okay, so um, yeah, so really, um, that's, as I say, I've stolen that presentation from what I've been doing this weekend. So they've got a narrow complex because we're using the Hispokinji, which is part of the course. And, and one of the things I think is, is quite important, if you do see something that is irregularly irregular, but it does look like flutter, then flutter doesn't give you irregularly irregular. It is atrial fibrillation. Um, the atrial ectopics, you can ignore that because that's part of a separate little slide there. 
happy to take any questions. And my chicken looks really, really <laughs> I, so it was interesting you were talking about don't you know don't trust uh the ekg when looking at flutter i don't know if you all have seen this before but i feel like even looking at egms for example right like egms you can really tell what's going on in the heart generally compared to an ekg because you have a lead inside each chamber but um sometimes when you're in the appendage I feel like I've seen it where it looks very organized, but it it still is a fib. So you end up with some degree Absolutely. of organization. Yeah. You, you do see that. And, um, you know, ultimately, if you have something that does not map into something that would do into an atrial flutter, be it three to one, four to one block, whatever, it can't be anything else apart from atrial fibrillation. You know, there's no other mediated mechanism for being that. So you, you're quite right. You, you look at stuff that looks really organized, and then you look at the 12 EDCG and you go, there's no way that can map out to be an atrial flutter. Then that second part is true. It isn't atrial flutter, it's atrial fibrillation. So AF can have some really organized periods where you look at it and go, that looks like an atrial flutter. That is atrial flutter full stop. But when you map it out, it is completely irregular. Yeah. I've got a quick question. So mm -hmm. to do the pre excite slaring of the pre excitation. Yeah. So where, where the accessory pathway is at the junction, atrium and, and, and ventricle, like at the junction, does it does it does the size of the slaring or the delta wave um depend on where where it is, where the where the accessory pathway is? So if it's remotely, if it's at the far end of the lateral LV wall. Yeah compared to if it's in the septum yeah um, like is this so it's all time related so if you've got something that is very close to the av node then it's come to the av node at the same time as it goes to the accessory pathway then you will get overt massive amounts of pre-excitation because the av node is going to be decremental it's going to stop nothing comes through everything is going to go straight down the uh, accessory pathway if you've got a free wall lateral uh, lv um uh, accessory pathway it's going to go down through backmans it's got all the way around the atria before it even gets to the accessory pathway so the amount of pre-excitation that you get very may be very minimal because it, a lot of the electrical supply has gone down the av node before it's even reached the accessory pathway even allowing for the fact that the accessory pathway is non-decremental uh, so yeah you're quite right does that answer your question yeah, brilliant. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Sorry, yeah. Passed away though. I said, oh, yeah. that, that's a really interesting question. So uh, you said when you talked about non-decremental properties as well, yeah. do you ever see decremental properties in accessory pathways or is that no. just a, a no, doesn't happen. nodal thing? Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Full stop. It's purely an AV nodal function um, and it's designed to have that function. That's how it works. So you don't get it with an accessory pathway. It is non-decremental. What about AV nodal decremental properties in retrograde? Ooh, um, is yeah. that decremental? Yes, it is decremental. So, yes, yeah, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when you've got someone who's got VT and you get retrograde P waves, you can get you can get Wenke back phenomena. You can get two to one heart, but you got everything you can get. Exactly the same you could do anti-gravely. Yeah, spot on. Any other questions? Well, oh, so what, what about, I mean, I know a lot of EP <laughs> consultants don't believe in this and his existence. I think I might have asked you this before about long Ganon Levine syndrome, like um, like accessory pathway in the AV node itself, like which is quite yeah, particular. Yeah, I mean it is. I mean, that's actually related to an association with deafness. You know, it's not related. You know, it's a, it's, it's a syndrome. And so, yes, we do get accessory pathways that bypass the AV nodes. Generally, they tend to be not able to conduct in a circuit. So they don't cause SVT. What they do cause is a short PR interval and potentially an, an ECG that represents uh, pre-excitation. So I've had an interesting pilot recently who's gone for his EP, so he came to his medical, had his resting ECG, he has a vert pre-excitation, uh, so I got him referred, he went over to a, a colleague in, uh, in Packworth, he had his EP study, 
they did his ablation, they got away with, uh, so he's, he had this overt inducible SVT, they ablated his accessory pathway, which is a, a left lateral free wall. We got rid of that. And actually, at rest, his ECG still showed a short PR interval. All right. So, so they went, OK, but they were completely non-inducible. They couldn't induce an SVT, whereas previously they were able to do so. So what they uh, and they, they were able to measure and I'm, I'm, I'm no longer an extra electrophysiologist, so I don't know the ins and outs, but they were able to measure and go, actually, this is not related to an accessory pathway anymore. This is related to an accessory. No, this is related to an extra pathway going alongside the AV node. And that is what causes the short PR interval. It's unable to sustain an SVT and, and it's completely clinically irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> now it's it's unable to say, sustain. Is it because of its? It doesn't have the the retrograde. Like why is it able to sustain? I guess we don't mind alluding on that a little more. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know whether it's related to the anti-grade retrograde properties or related to its abilities to sustain in terms of you know uh, rate. Um, I I don't know. Just to be honest. Either way, it doesn't do it. And the electrophysiologist sent me the letter said it can't sustain an SVT. Full stop. And I was like, well, that's what I needed to know from an aviation point of view. Any other questions? Am I still here? <laughs> yes, you asked. Oh, okay, well, you blimey, go on, no, Lord. It was very silent there for a while. Oh, my Lord, on my own. The zombies are going to come and get me. Oh, no. Yeah, great talk, Dr. Timpley. The uh, type A and type B, is there any obvious way to distinguish it on the ECG? Because you have yeah, a lot you of can do, but, but it's to be absolutely frank, it's completely irrelevant. Because as soon as you get into the, uh, the EP study, you then work out exactly where it is. So it doesn't add anything clinically. It's, a, it's a, one of those things you do to knock around in the lab before they go to, to go and have their procedures. They say, oh, where do you think it is? It's going to be left-sided, left, sided, left right-sided. And it's generally... Yeah. It's reasonably accurate, but it's irrelevant. It, you, you still okay. need, if you've got pre excitation and they're under the age of 40, from a pro prognostic point of view, they should have an EP study to work out af if they are at any excess risk or not. Yes. Over 40, okay. you can make a case going, oh, this is interesting. Have you got any symptoms? No. In which case, you can make a case over the age of 40 going, we're not going to do an EP study we're not altering mortality anymore we're only doing it from symptoms if you've got no symptoms then why are we doing the ep study yep good yeah. then well, the next question is on issue of coronary sinus reading Dr. Tipley, coronary sinus reading or any reading EP coming study from coronary sinus reading I'm, yeah a, a focal an EP point study. from the yes yeah. So a focal point, if there is a focal point from the coronary sinus, with the P wave, is there any difference in the P wave compared to a focal point coming from any point of the right atrium or the left atrium? I mean, it depends where in the coronary sinus it is. So if it's coming from the coronary sinus off, then generally it'll look like a right atrial. But if it's coming yeah. further around, you can end up with a left atrial looking one. Having said that, you're not going to get right. inside there. So yes, um, sir. it's 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 a mute point, really, because it doesn't add to what we're going to be doing. Um, what's the most likely one to occur? I don't know is the honest answer. Um, it's probably more likely to be in the CS os rather than deep into the yeah. CS. So most of them will look like a, a right atrial. OK, now my next question is on the issue of multifocal atrial uh, tachycardia. Yes. What do you have to say on this, sir? Yes, it's a, it's a nuisance. It's a bugger. I think there's two major age groups that it occurs in. Um, uh, one is younger people and one is older people. The older ones are easy. Just give them amiotrin. Yes. Just give them lots of, give them more amiotrin. The other group that it tends to occur with, which can be problematic, is either pregnant females or young females. And then you've got a difficult problem because you know, multi-focal uh, atrial tachycardia, ablation is a useless procedure for it, so you're left with medical therapy. Yes. So, sorry, my lights have just yes. gone Turn that back on. Uh, so um, you're left in the situation going, well, what can we do medical therapy-wise to do things? And ideally, amiodarone works really well, but you don't want to be giving that to a youngster. 
So um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's difficult. Okay. Thank you, sir. So easy answer to it. You know, but obviously try a beta blocker first. In a younger patient, probably you, you can try flecainide as well to be uh, to try, but it may not be very very helpful. But it's worth a go before considering amiodarone. Great, just quick, quick, quick question. So I know you've spoken about. I just want you to clarify for the for the um, maybe it's people who are learning about ECG that. <clears throat> On an ECG tracing, when you see the slur in the delta wave, that's called a manifest pre-excitation. Manifest. Overt is the term. Overt, 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 overt yeah, yeah. pre-excitation. And then the one that you don't see, which is the which is the dodgy one, which um, JT mentioned, the concealed, um, concealed accessory pathway, concealed um, um, pathway, is when the 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 basically nothing they've got normal ecg tracing and then they're playing football and and yeah. golf or bed or somebody going some kind of atrial tachyo af mm. some SPT, and it conducts straight yeah. down the accessory pathway as a preference for that and then they go into that really fast rhythm that's the one that you can you can easily die with which absolutely, we absolutely. so so the issue there is is so when you end up with um, uh, a a uh, an accessory pathway that's a long way away from the AV node, at rest, you may see no evidence of pre-excitation on 12 ECG because all of the conduction is going down the AV node. And it's a long, long way away. And that's not just anatomically, but electrically. So you can have something that's reasonably close, but it just takes a long while to get down. And these people may have not have any problems whatsoever. And then suddenly you have something like, as you said, about atrial fibrillation. I had a similar chap who was a hockey player for uh, uh, GB and uh, he was absolutely fine. He came in with atrial fibrillation conduction rate of 280 beats per minute. But obviously that's not good. Uh, but at rest, his ECG, because he had 12 ECG done for the Olympics, was completely normal. And it does happen like that. And there's... There's not a lot you can do, you know, it's just bad luck. Uh, and then dealing with the problem when it occurs. Yeah. So if you have a patient, for example, in the real world that, that has some sort of syncope, a young patient, would how do you find this? Is it a stress test or how would you try to, to locate this kind of issue? So so if I'm expecting to, to, to look for evidence pre-excitation, because, you know, exertional, pre uh, exertional syncope is a reasonably, well, that's not true. Exertional post syncope is a very common problem. You know, people passing out after exercise is actually reasonably common. People passing out during exercise is much less common. So what would I do? Someone comes in, a 20 year old, um, he's got an episode of, uh, of syncope. I would do an exercise test. I would do an echocardiogram, I'd do a 24 hour tape. And then if I don't get the answer on any of those, and there's nothing that says I should be doing a tilt test, then I'd fit them with a, a um, ILR. Will there be maybe a family history as well? Something? Maybe? Oh, yeah, we do that during the, yeah, you take family history during the examination. So, yeah, so, so I took that for granted. Yeah. So um, turn and say, okay. Everyone no, in my family yeah. is dead at the age of 25. Wow, you know, bets are off and we've got to go and do something different. Yeah. Um, yes. yes. Dr. Timpley, is there yeah. any way we can also look at fascicular tachycardia, how to, a uh, fascicular uh tachycardia and supra ventricular tachycardia is is there any way to uh to get a clear note on ekg on these issues yes i have those i'm just looking i'm on the wrong screen uh why don't i do one on vt in a few weeks time mm. very good because yeah. uh, our fellow will be going for exams yeah, that would be yeah. fine because the fellows will be going for exam in October. So if we can get um, yeah. AJ, uh, can arrange another one, maybe uh, Give me a after... few weeks, two or three to eight weeks time, and then I'll get one sorted. Very good, very good. I'm just looking Thank at you, sir. Perfect. Any more AJ. questions from the group? Am I frozen? Nope, maybe not. Perfect. Well, I no. think we're good. Um, Dr. Timpley, I will follow up with you 
and we will set up another time to do a talk yeah. on that Thank before you. our fellows go in uh, for their tests. Yeah. But I really appreciate the talk today. That was that was very enlightening, and I, I definitely am going to review it once we get it up on YouTube to, to scan it again. So thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your Sunday to uh, to speak with us. And please go enjoy your chicken, Dr. Tepoli. <laughs> it's, it's, it's out now. So it's, it's, thank it's, you so much, sir. Thank you so <laughs> much. Very, very oh, interesting topic. JT, thank can you, we see it? Can we see it? Yeah. Can, can we, we see the chicken? chicken? Give me five seconds. I'll bring the chicken in. Let me just say <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, JT. Yeah. Julius, what do you think about the talk? It was it was fantastic. Yeah, it was really good. Really, really very good. fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask him out there what were the prevalence of. Pre oh, that looks all right. Oh, that, that looks all right. Oh, that looks <laughs> bad, boy. That was amazing. Nice one. Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, it was it was a really really good talk. Really really liked it. Um, don't know the prevalence of um, pre excitation and uh, is there more in Europe than in Africa or is it is it the same? Is it what well, I mean? I wanted to ask: is it um, is it a social? I wouldn't be a social economic thing, but um, it is it is related to a lot of congenital cardiac. Mm. Um, is that right, JT? Well, sorry, I just got back. Sorry, last question. Yeah. You yes. are, you are right. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. Find the chicken strong back. He's lovely. He's having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, um, Julius, the issue of uh, being more in Europe than Africa, I think a study has to be done on it. Uh, the reason why I think the reason why you see that it's more in Europe because there are studies in uh, a more Caucasian to show all this. When you come to the mm. sub-Saharan Africa, you don't really have uh, most, most of m most of all these studies. Uh, like if you mm. come to the sub-Saharan Africa, which is the bulk of Africa, and that is where you have the repopulations of Africa, uh, is that you have not done enough work to say that these things are not there or they are there. You have not really done enough until you start looking for them here. That is why you start seeing them. Let me give you an example. A few a few years back, they would say that uh, we don't have um, enough uh, uh, coronary artery disease. We don't have enough um, uh, heart block uh, around here. But we know that those things are there. When you go to the community, you see them there. And uh, the chains of referral here and the chains of referral in Europe are two different things. And North America are two different things entirely. And uh, North America and Europe has a uh, similar chains of referral, but when you come to the sub-Saharan African region, you have um, uh, you have scarcity of head professional. You have many things that count against you in order to pick up all these issues. So until we do a very clear study, you can't really say that they are not here or they are there. I think they are here, but we have not looked enough on them to pick them up. Uh, take example the. Uh, the pacemaker clinical trial, just uh, less than uh, half of the year, just a single center in just a single center in Nigeria has had almost 40 patients in randomization. So before, if these free pacemakers were not there, you won't see that kind of thing happening. Because if a patient comes and he cannot afford it, you go back and the patient may end up dying somewhere and nobody will talk about it. So these are the issues. So the health system, the challenges facing boats are not exactly at the same level. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant, good. That's an interesting point about screening, but what about, um, you know, like rheumatic heart disease, could that could that ever play a factor as well? Because you have higher incidence rate of that in, in population. Yes, we like have a lot, for we, yeah, we, 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 we have a, a lot of uh, congenital heart disease uh, in the region, in the South South African. But most of these congenital heart disease, they are actually being seen uh, at the level of the pediatrics uh, age group. So uh, now the same thing also occur when how many uh, pediatrics cardiology uh, uh, practice uh, in the regions and how many of them are actually uh, seeing this uh, group of uh, patients. That is one, two. 
uh, those that transit into adults, um, how many of them are being followed by uh, the adult uh, uh, cardiologist? So th that is another issue. So, but you have those uh, symptoms here. Then another issue again is that those that have complex uh, congenital heart diseases, you know, the chances of living into adult in the sub saharan Africa is very rare because of the challenges they face, finances, infections, and the rest of them. So many of them end up passing up before they get in, into the uh, the adult age where an adult uh, cardiologist will see them. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, actually. Uh, yeah, we um, yeah. In 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 contrast to what happens, yeah, I mean, in Scotland, there was there was an, an older guy. I think it must have been in his sixties or something. Had, but never needed to come into hospital. And they did an echo and discovered that um, he had Epstein's anomaly um, and he had wow. citation as well. So uh, Epstein's anomaly is the atrialization of the right ventricle. So the atrial right. like valve just shifts, moves into the right ventricle and it becomes really, really large and the right ventricle becomes really tiny. Um, and right. usually have like... Pre um, pre-excitation um, accessory pathway uh, somewhere. So- um, Yeah, very correct. Yeah. And, and so what- what, what There is a work, mm -hmm. uh, Rogelio, there is a work we are doing currently on um, on Epst uh, Epstein's anomaly. Okay. And it, yeah, we have not published the data, but very soon I'm sure we'll publish those data. But it will shock you that when you look at those uh, data, most of the patient we are picking up that are included, they were people that are of young age group. And most of the women that are there, they actually came into the picture because they got married. And you know, in Africa, when you get married, as a woman, the household, the work become very tedious for you because everybody will come for your wedding. If I the preparation of that wedding, you'll be so much involved in it. And then, you know, you have the traditional wedding, you also have the, the white wedding, which is a church wedding. Uh, if you are a, a Christian, the Muslim, you do the Islamic rite. Then once you finish, everybody will go to their house and you'll be left alone with your husband. So in your mother's house, you may not be sweeping the house, you may not be cooking and uh, taking stress of cooking and doing all that because there are other siblings. But when you now get into your own house, where now you are now the woman of the house, you do all the cooking and all the rest because of the tradition of the people. So at the end of the day, the, the, the young lady is being stressed off and it manifests with her failure. So that is the point most of these people now end up coming to the uh, cardiologists. And when they come, they feel that, ah, Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, we've lost him. That's an interesting it's manifestation so of large. Oh, he's back. So these are the things that we <laughs> talked about. <laughs> so AJ, you cannot rule out culture. Cultures leave cultures the way they are. Over time, they may be modified. But leave them to evolve mm. with the people. You can't, that is the way I see it, sir. <laughs> so when when, you, when we publish that paper, we show it to you because these are the things that we're pointing out in that paper. So most of the patient, although we have some we picked up at above forty, but most of them is below thirty, and the women that were there, most of them are below thirty, and they came in because they got married and they went into. Uh, after the within two three months of marriage, they enter into this problem and they pick them up. And funny thing, they don't do well. They don't do well here because uh, maybe when the paper comes, I will we'll talk about more on it. That's I, I would love to to read it. Uh, so my mother in law is is a is a pediatrician out here in Rwanda um, and works in early childhood development. And works a lot with new mothers. So it's, and also like um, people just starting out with family. So it'd be very interesting to see, you know, that manifestation um, as a result to, you know, environmental stress that you just don't even think about. Yeah. So there are many things that, that really stresses 
uh, the environment, like in Europe, you don't have that so much. Um, I, I know your culture has involved far more than what we have here. Um, and um, you can pick people up at more, much, much age, uh, age group, but here most of them are being picked up at the point where they are now being left to fend for themselves. They now involve themselves in strenuous activity. They will end up coming down with problem. And when you do the echo, you pick them up. Atrialization of the, of the right ventricle. Interesting. This is a really good talk. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Dante, for the-, for the uh, you know, Thank you very about. much. This is fantastic. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, well, we look forward to your to your upcoming paper and, um, you know, to everyone studying for your exams. If you have any questions for us regarding device or electrophysiology, just reach out to the group. We're here to we're here to help in whatever capacity we can. But uh, thank yes. you, everybody, for taking time on your Sunday. I know we took up almost uh, two and a half hours of your time. So I really appreciate you all sticking with us for this. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks, AJ. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you so you. much. Have really a great day. Thank you, Dr. Tipley. Thank, thank you, Dafe. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, yes, thank thank you. Thank you Julius. Thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Nice to meet you again.